Hello, in this episode I interviewed Mark Carnes and Andy Lamy about the use of reacting games to teach philosophy. Mark Carnes is a professor at Barnard College in New York City. He is the one who invented the reacting games. Andy Lamy is a professor at the University of California, San Diego. We talked about how the reacting games were created and how beneficial they can be for teaching, but we also talked about the potential problems and challenges with that method of teaching. For instance, how to deal with topics that involve racism or sexism. I am sure you will enjoy this interview. Okay, so, uh, uh, well, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much, Mark. That is a huge pleasure. I started uh, uh, researching about this topic and then I came across the reacting games. And, and I thought, and then I started reading the, your book, uh, Minds on Fire, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, no. and, and then I thought like, wow, if I could get in touch, uh, and it's fantastic. This is fantastic. That's, that's really good. Okay, so uh, I, I think the book is fantastic. Uh, I recommend everyone who works in teaching philosophy or also like students as well who are interested in that to read the book. But it's nice for you to present a little bit for those who haven't read the, the, the book. Uh, so the first question, so that's for Mark, uh, is how did you uh, got the idea of making the reaction games? It's beautifully written in the book, but if you can tell us how did yeah, you... I'll, try, I'll, I'll give you an idea. abbreviated version of it. Uh, I was sort of... And it's, this has been true of quite a few of the people who have embraced reacting. There are faculty members often who are, um, they've gotten, they're, they're well established in their career and they realize that they're, they don't need to grab for the next achievement. I, I had gotten tenure at Columbia and I'd finished a big project, uh, with the American national biography, which was 24 million words. And, uh, that was that was sort of done, and I thought I was a good teacher. I had good students, and I was teaching the the great books of, uh, of philosophical texts. And yet, my students were bored, and I was bored, and I dreaded going to class just because it would be seventy five minutes of boredom. Now, this is really this is crazy. Uh, so the next year, I I. Um, structured this class sort of as a series of debates. The first one was the the, the trial of Socrates based on the Republic, and uh, it, which has been done many, many times. And the class was fine. Uh, it was as good as my sort of discussion classes on the Republic. Um, nothing particularly special, but I was satisfied with it. Then the next the debates were set in Ming China and was supposed to be about Confucius. And what happened then was that two students, the, the emperor and the first grand secretary, used their nominal power to take control of the class from me. And what I realized that when I let them do that and gave them real control of the class, that suddenly the class was energized and a host of complicated psychological forces were converging where students were competing with each other in, in the sort of social ways that, that, that we see so, so obviously in, in sororities and fraternities and also on social media today. That that's a lot of what student life is about is social competition. And by turning over the class to them, uh, where they are competing on the ideas of Confucius as applied to a problem of governance in Minjana, it came alive which then created the conundrum. I now have students who are deeply engaged in a classroom that's uh, vibrant and exciting, but they're talking and I'm not, and they don't know the material. <laughs> but that sort of gave the idea to me that if you could create a structure, uh, imagine that education could be a house where you as the instructor create create a building filled with the content and furnish it with the content and then push students in and get them to explore it on their own ways that, that are competing with each other and uh, um, so that became really the the idea of reacting is to create a, a an elegant structure then use social competition and uh, the power of make-believe giving them alternative identities and 
then pushing them in the structure and make the structure elegant enough and complex enough that they would learn the content. And all the while, they'd also learn things about leadership and teamwork and critical thinking by exploring it themselves. Um, that evolved over time, but that was sort of the beginning idea that you, the job of the the job was to create these structures uh, that would be enticing and then use the natural social competition and the the appeal of make believe to to get them to explore those those structures. Yeah, it, I recommend reading the book, and it's fantastic how your two students they they got power there and, yeah. and how the, the things got triggered. And that is wonderful. Um, uh, so uh, my next question is for both Andy and you, Mark. Uh, it's, so it's about the positive aspects and the potential negative aspects. Now, Andy, I read your paper and your paper also address all these topics as well. But yeah, if you can talk a bit about that. So like, what are the positive aspects and negative aspects? So I'm thinking here, uh, uh, both in terms of the students and for those teaching and for the professors and tutors and those teaching. Uh, uh, yeah, if you can say a bit about all the positive aspects and potential negative aspects. Um, so the positives, I think there's quite a few positives and there's been previous papers written about this. Um, and I think one, a couple of things shine through. So one is, by its nature, the game gives students a reason uh, to get better at public speaking, which is a huge skill across a huge number of occupations they'll have after they leave university. Uh, the teamwork building skills are really strongly incentivized. Um, there's been one study suggested that students who play these games, they have higher level, they do better on empathy tests after they take the class than students who take a similar class without using role immersion. Um, something, I ran a focus group with students after I uh, used my game for the first time. And a recurring comment was the students said that they were really strongly incentivized to really get to know the texts and the readings to a much more significant degree than if they were studying them in the more conventional way. So those are all really, I think, uh, big positives. And then because I'm using them in philosophy classes, I think they also immerse the students in the historical milieu to an enormous degree, much more than they otherwise would when I'm using a, an actual reacting game proper. That is one set in the past, unlike mine. Um, there, I, there, the, I strongly agree with Mark about how the, the, the competitive nature incentivizes their, unleashes their passions, which is also a big positive. If I had to mention a downside, it's for the one that I that I'm most conscious of because I'm using the games to teach philosophy as opposed to history, is that I, uh, occasionally students will get so caught up in the competitive side of things that it becomes a bit more about winning to to a degree that I'm not comfortable with, rather than careful analysis of the arguments. But there's ways to address that in how you assess them um, afterwards. So that's that's more of a potential negative than I think a deep a deep structural feature. And for professors, for me, um, uh, I enjoy it a lot. I love seeing, I get to know the students much better than I normally otherwise would. So there's a lot of, I, it's like I'm sort of unleashing them, if I can put it this way. I, they can, in my classroom, they can be their full self in a way that is not the case when they're just sitting there and they're just this talking head from the neck up. Um, the downside uh, is it, it's, it's not, you, there's no training for this. So luckily, it's interesting to me when Mark said that a lot of people he knows do this when they're already quite well established. I was this junior teaching professor and I really wanted like something new and big. So the great thing about reacting for me was that it runs training conferences that train faculty like me who might be interested, but otherwise would never get up the courage to jump in, you know, into the deep end as it were and do this. So for me, the biggest negative was, oh my God, how am I gonna learn to do this? But there's the the consortium has an answer, and it's the form of the training conferences. I think Andy touched on all of the points very very nicely. I I would say for philosophy, and I'm sure Andy would agree with me that 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 one problem would be that the students, because they are approaching this in a competitive way, they will use the texts in a very instrumental way. That they will they will say, uh, 
I'm against this text and I'll rip it to shreds and find all the ways to rip it to shreds, or I'm supporting it and I'll find ways to endorse it. Um, so the readings tend to be very partisan and one-sided, and that's not particularly what we wish to, to inculcate in philosophy courses. On the other hand, what they're getting is they're getting two sides of, of, of a philosophical argument and very, very clearly in ways that matter. And so often our discussions on the history of ideas and philosophies, uh, students zone out because it doesn't seem to matter. Mm. Uh yeah, uh, this connected to this about this going inside the history and using the history. So, from my personal uh, experience, I so I'm finishing my PhD here in the University of Manchester in the UK. I did my master's here as well, but I did my undergrad in Brazil in philosophy, all philosophy. And when I did my undergrad in Brazil, because Brazil followed France, so it's very history of philosophy. So all of my professors, they were all they would consider themselves as historians of philosophy. Uh, and then the first year, it was, I, I enjoyed it very much. The first year was just Greeks, just the Greeks. And we would even have, we would have to read the Odyssey and even learn a little bit of ancient Greek philosophy. And they thought that it's really good if you could like, I don't know, if you're reading uh, uh, from, I don't know, from the Enlightenment, read literature from that yeah. time. So read the literature from the time and the area where you're uh, uh, studying. From, a his, from the perspective of history of philosophy, I think the reacting games, they serve, I mean, wonderfully. I mean, it fits wonderfully, that perspective. But here in the UK, I feel that most philosophy courses and most, I mean, the vast majority here in Manchester, for instance, they do not take history into account very much. They are really, it's more like contemporary analytic things. And, and so I wonder if, how could I use the reacting games? Like how to, would there be a clash with the, you know, the project that the departments have here? Because it feels to me that the reacting games, they work better when you take the history more seriously, or are there variations where you don't have to take the history so seriously? Can I jump in here? So my, my game is certainly inspired by your reaction, reacting, and I preserve what I think of as the core structure which is students divided into factions um, in a milieu where they have to get indeterminates on board. So teams who have to reach out to individual players. But my game is not set in the past. It's set in an alternative contemporary. It's set, if it were in the UK, it would be the UK. Um, if it's what I use it in the States, it's set in the States and so on. So there's that historical element is not part of it. Um, so, so I guess there's role immersion and then there's reacting proper. And uh, role immersion need not necessarily be set in the past. I have a colleague here in San Diego who teaches at another university, um, and their their program, like the ones you describe, is not primarily historically oriented. And she's made her own game, but it's organized around, uh, I think it's the Roe versus Wade court decision in the U.S., which I guess is a bit historical now that I think about it, but it's, it also has obvious contemporary bearing, right? So so role immersion and reacting um, often overlap, but they're not quite the same, and there's no rule written into the nature of role immersion as such that it always has to be historical, um, even if that is the, the great strength of the reacting games proper, at least in my mind. Yeah, you know, as I would... Uh... I'm I'm a partisan in this this debate that I first taught at uh, in the uh, Columbia University is since the 19 late 19 uh, 1919 I think it is has had their great books program as a required uh, component of their undergraduate education and as a graduate student at Columbia I taught in that program so which was entirely these great books which speak to each other across the centuries and generate the the great philosophical debates that inspire the best minds of the West sort of thing. Um, and I, I taught in that program and I, I, I thought it failed pedagogically in that the students, other than trying to impress the instructor with the, the, they, that they could say something um, of value about, about Kant or Edmund Burke or Plato, um, they didn't engage with it. They didn't understand it. That it was all, uh, it was all in uh, a, a intellectual game. 
with no resonance. And yet, in most cases, these ideas were ideas that people lived and died for. And to say, to, to tell students to read Edmund Burke without asking them to understand the civil constitution of the clergy and some real details in the French Revolution is absurd. You cannot understand Burke's thought without, without the sort of context that he, is, that he is writing about. Nor can you understand Plato's Republic if you don't have a pretty good grasp of the, of the Athenian democracy that was generating this radical new worldview that's transforming arts, literature, medicine, mathematics, philosophy, and everything else. And, and to try to look at Plato's Republic without any cognizance of this vibrant and extraordinary human experiment in democracy is absurd. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a partisan on this, uh, obviously. And so what, what do I say to the philosophers in these programs? I say it's pedagogically not, it's pedagogically unsound to extract the ideas from the context that caused people to live and die over them. Um, it bores students. And worse, it means that you are sapping those texts of the context that gave them much of their meaning. So so I'm, I'm that doesn't help you at all. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, my other question is about that. I interviewed other professors who have used the reacting game, specifically Shoshana Bradfield. And she said that uh, it's very intense for her as well. She has to work more than she would work in a normal class because she needs to attend the students. So there is a lot of uh, this with the students. And that the students have to read way more. So they actually engage with, with the material. And my personal experience is that students, they never engage. My personal experience is that the students, there's always one or two students who engage, but most don't engage and they don't really engage. But so that they engaging in that subsur sub subversive element in which the teacher, the professor figure removes from that position. Can you, can you two talk about that? Andy, can you say about your experience and Mark about, about more about that subver sub ah, subversive aspect of the role immersion games? Um, it's, yes, it's true. There is a high level of engagement. Um, I find, especially when I use the game in an upper level elective class and all the students want to be there, that's when you get massive engagement. Uh, when we, I used the Athens game in a class online during the uh, COVID-19 quarantine. And um, the lesson for me of that class is, okay, I needed to clearly tell students that after five o'clock, they should stop sending messages because some of them would just get overwhelmed with the sheer amount of game. It'd be like 24 seven, especially for the person who's trying to run the assembly. So, so yes, there is a ton of, of buy-in, especially when they realize like Mark said, that they are in charge and that their decisions really matter. I would say that that in a way, the at one stage of my career, when I was intent on getting tenure and advancing, the best students were the students who didn't show up and didn't do anything, and I didn't have to do anything with, because then I could just focus on 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 research and writing um so there's something to be there's there's something of a compact that if students don't do anything and don't expect anything of instructors that and, and instructors don't expect anything of students but still pass them that 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 it's the best of both worlds except that no one learns anything um it's hard to break that compact, you know, that it's everybody gains by it, except that you have a sense that your career as an educator was was a nullity and that your academic importance was confined to your two dozen people in your field who might read your papers and be on your panels and things like that. And what's it all mean? So. Um, The, the the big gain is the, the problem is that students are motivated and they want feedback and they they they, they love encouragement they love uh, that the instructor is there on the sidelines applauding their successes and helping them through their failures 
but there's a real satisfaction in doing that. And, and Andy touched on this, that one of the interesting things is when you give students adult type situations and roles and behaviors, they act like adults, but 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 adults who are like real adults, not adults who are going through college and, yeah. and sucking up to the instructor. And they, they become much more interesting and the, the dilemmas that they get and the situations they create become compelling in their own right. The papers are are interesting in a way that they, the others were never interesting. It's for the instructor more work, but less, uh, more interesting and more satisfying in a sort of a deep way. Um, that's that's what I'd say, and I agree with everything that Andy said too. Mm. Um, uh, that using games to teach. It seems very alternative way of teaching. Like if you approach like the head of department and I want to do something like this, has there been any resistance to using the reacting games? Uh, or no, in your experience, Andy and Mark, it has been smooth and it has been okay. Or if it has been some, uh, let's say, skepticism about people thinking like, will that work? And, and they are not certain if it will work. There's there's tremendous skepticism. Um, and that often groups uh, within a faculty, there will be a group of uh, five or six reacting proponents, and they'll propose to create a curricular space for reacting type classes. And very often the other faculty members will say, no, we don't want a curricular space for game playing. We're serious scholars. We're serious teachers. Um, and then when they offer the reacting instructors offer rebuttals, such as the research that shows that students learn much more than they they say, well, research they ignore it. Then when the reacting instructors say, but what about the four decades of learning research, which our education departments have been publishing on in our universities, showing that lectures and unstructured discussions are very ineffective learning tools. This is what others have been saying for four decades in thousands of papers. You're ignoring all of that. And the faculty say, we don't believe that. We believe that, that the way we learned is the best way. We have faith in the way we learned in graduate school. So here we've got academics who, are, who champion science and research and hard knowledge, but in matters of pedagogy, they have faith in their traditions. It's just insane. Um, so, so yes, there's substantial resistance, and often the resistors refuse to visit a reacting class. They say, I'm not going to waste my time. I've got important things to do. I know it's idiotic. I know that playing games is, is going to be just cringeworthily embarrassing. So they won't even come to visit a class. And so reacting instructors, and I'm sure and this is true of Andy, often say to their colleagues, come and just see what's going on. It's not what you think, because you can't imagine this. And often the critics will say, no, I just, I just don't, I don't need to. So it's been uh, fighting against embedded traditions that have been made sacrosanct because they're based on the the model of of their graduate school of a, the graduate school mentor um clinging to this faith and tradition make them very resistant to something as radical as reacting so it's it's a battle recurring battle on many campus on many campuses in the united states and i think i think that the systems in much of europe are in many ways more rigid than uh uh, then the United States is one reason why why I'm here today. That that you're an inquiring person who's trying to nudge folks who are accustomed to a very rigid system. Is it is it effective? I, 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 what can I say about the United Kingdom's educational system? Um, I've gone so, on another rant. So Jonas, uh, Mark as I think you can tell, is the voice of experience on this issue. And he's been the great apostle for reacting. And so I think he has much more experience on this point than I do. In my more limited do domain, I've encountered a little bit of skepticism, but but not very much. 
I run a couple of training conferences and I'll give surveys to the participants and there'll be a little bit of skepticism sometimes. And not, of course, not everybody who took the conferences used the game, but a lot of people do buy in. And if you look at the reacting uh, Facebook group, I think that's got thousands of members now. Um, <clears throat> I I know the kinds of arguments that Mark is referring to, and it is an unfortunate reality that people do make them. But I guess when I encounter that skepticism, my first thought is you're skeptical about it in comparison to what? And it seems that a lot of the skepticism is just based, it's like a status quo bias. It's because it's new, right? And I'm like, okay, well, if you guys want perfect irrefutable evidence, let's take that standard and apply that to conventional teaching. Now, why do we do the conventional stuff? Well, if you pull on that thread, the answer is ultimately, because that's how we did it in the Middle Ages. And that's not a great answer. So I'll take the I'll take the research that Mark is talking about as opposed to that kind of dead hand and tradition that you do you do run up against sometimes, but in my in my experience, not to a fatal degree. I think Andy, you're probably a very effective uh, proponent to you. You you probably are psychologically very uh, very adroit. But a lot of the people who don't come to the to, to to your sessions, you know, you just never connect. You made the argument to them, and they didn't come. No, that view that view is absolutely out there. I I totally agree, and it's it's disappointing for all the reasons you mentioned. But but here's here's the last thing I'd say on this, and I think it's absolutely the truth is that the traditionalists, I would say, who don't really enjoy the classroom, who who will do everything they can to get out of the classroom, that they will they will beg, borrow, or steal to get a sabbatical or to get a course release or something because it's so onerous that, that they're not having fun with their argument defending traditions that they can barely endure themselves, okay? Um, and so they will make the argument, and then as Andy says, but are you happy in the classroom? Do you, if so, why do, why do you appeal for, for course releases all the time? Um, and they're not happy with their argument. We're often losing our arguments to people who are skeptical and see what we're doing as um, diluting higher education of turning it into fun and games. Um, we know that's not the case, and we're having fun with it. And from my from my knowledge of revolutions, of intellectual revolutions, of philosophical revolutions, those who are having fun with their arguments prevail on the long run. Uh, it's it's I think of Galileo, and one of his problems was not that he was right, but that he had so much fun being right. So that that when he would have a dispute on uh, on on cosmology, and uh, he would invite his disputants to make him publicly. Let's do it publicly, and then they'd make an argument, and he'd say, "Okay, if you want to make that argument." Let's make it this way. And he'd reshape their argument to make it much more powerful. And then the students would say, yeah, see, that's you can't refute that. And then he had, in the next half hour, he'd refute it brilliantly, and the, and the opponents would be humiliated. And, and Galileo's friends would say to him, don't humiliate your enemies. You know, don't, don't do that. But he couldn't resist it. It was so much fun. Uh, so so it's, it's sort of true in the reacting world that we're having fun, that there are that every campus has got its proselytes and in, and the critics and the critics are not having any fun with their arguments. Um, we're having fun. And so we're, 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 we're winning these sort of uh, debates, even though we end up being uh, um, declared as heretics hmm. in some tribunals. Uh, uh, yeah, it seems that we put, if it's fun, it cannot be serious, it cannot be truly engaging, as if, if it's fun, it's disposable, it's, it's less, and it's, it's very strange, and as you put it, professors don't want to teach, students don't want to learn, so what is this, so what's going on, we're just selling diplomas, that's it, right, I mean, it, that's, that's the feeling that we got, and maybe it is what's happening, so, you know, and sometimes, sometimes when, institutions become far removed from their ostensible purpose, they suddenly collapse. And and we say, no, that's not going to happen in higher education. Well, you know, it's just, it, it doesn't take a, 
a genius historian to see that that general principle that when institutions are deeply removed from the objective, the deeper objectives of the people, you know, it's they're serving, there is a vulnerability. Can I can I just add one last thought here? Just this is, it's interesting to think about reacting within the context of universities as institutions. And we're talking about sort of, I guess, something negative, the skepticism. But every once in a while, there will be these really nice institutional incentives that come together to make reacting especially valuable. I can think of two examples. I use the game, as I mentioned, in some online classes when COVID came along. And those classes had a way higher level of student buy-in and the comments they wrote afterwards were much more positive. And so it was a way, especially early in the Zoom teaching during COVID, the, the institutional context we were in allowed the game to be, I would say, especially valuable because it contributed to much greater social connection between the, certainly the students, but also between me and them and me than otherwise would have been the case if I had just blabbed into Zoom. And I think Mark knows well about this as well. Um, there are administrators who really like reacting because it for them, I think it's like the best of two things they really care about. It's highly effective and it doesn't require a ton of technology and expensive stuff. It's actually pretty cheap. So every once in a while, you'll get an administrator who's like, where have you been all my life? And they create a welcoming environment. I mean, Andy's absolutely right on that point, that while faculty, especially senior faculty, tend to be skeptical, if not downright resistant, administrators, at least in the United States, um, they go to their own conferences. And I've gone to some of, to, to, to a bunch of the administrative conferences and uh, to make presentations. But most of the sessions at the administrative conferences, this is for presidents and deans and provosts, there are two types of sessions. One session says, don't try to lead from above, that, that you'll get in real trouble if you try to teach, to try to draw the faculty to do something, um, tell them how to do their jobs better. The other conference is that you are losing a connection with your consumers, with your students, and your institution is imperiled because they're disengaged. You need to explore active learning pedagogies. You need to make active learning. So on the one hand, the administrators are, are hearing, you've got to transform your classes to make them active learning. Then the next session they go to says, don't try to change things from above. So what happens, Andy, I think you understated that at every campus, just about every campus, when the, this reacting uh, faculty member becomes excited, I say, go to your dean and ask for money. And almost always, they're ecstatic because someone is proposed, propo they don't understand reacting, they may not visit a class, but they see it's active learning, and they don't have to lead it. So we've had, it's a really weird alliance between administrators and the reacting uh, enthusiasts on different campuses against uh, uh, traditionalist faculty who don't want to change things. And, it, and which actually makes the makes it more fun because often you get money to it to support your work. So it's fun and it's supported by the administration. And many reacting faculty then decide they want to become administrators. We have got probably two dozen reacting faculty who are now deans at, uh, and a few of them are provosts. One dean's office at a time. Yes. Right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was talking to um, another professor who have used the reacting games, and she said how uh, it it's inclusive, how it can get students to participate, students who would not participate, and how it, it's much easier to not just to get students. It, it means that it's achieving students who otherwise would not be achieved. It means that it's getting students who would otherwise not engage. Uh, uh, if you can say a bit about this, but also you're, with honest, one... What, what, what I'm, look, forgive me for interrupting, but Andy will be a, a superb source in this. Um, I think we've gone through the questions you had for me that I could offer comments. What if I just bug out on you now? Oh, it's completely fine. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank this you is, very much. Look, I've enjoyed it. You've asked terrific questions, and I'm really... I'm really hopeful that, that, that you'll you'll initiate a, a, a little revolution in, in at Manchester in the United Kingdom. And I wish you all. There are a handful of other people who have approached us who've, who've tried to take on the British uh, 
uh, system, which is so. So I, I, I wish you well, and um, but I know that that Andy will answer these questions better than I will. So I'm, I'll, I'll bop out and uh, stay in touch. Okay, thank you very much, Mark Carnes. Thank you very much. Right. I'll let you know when I publish the video. Thank you. Terrific. Bye bye now. Good to see you. So long, Andy. Okay, Andy. So you have some more time that we can talk. So oh like yeah, 10, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Shoshana Bresfield and she said how it includes students. Uh, but there is one cave caveat that you mentioned in your paper as well. I'm thinking the, about international students because you have to talk and many students, they're learning the language and they don't feel confident enough to talk. So what do you, what do you think about this? So my experience is in line with some of the peer-reviewed research I read about this on specifically on the point you mentioned of international students. The first time I used the game, I had a student who was in the category you're describing. I think he was from China and uh, English was his second language. And in his comments, he said, in this class, I got to know students way more than I otherwise would because I was obliged to engage with them. Usually when I go to class, it's just like some meeting downtown. I come in, I go, but here I really got to know everybody. And so students like that are sometimes apprehensive, but it's, but in a way it seems like they often have the most to benefit from. Um, I'll sometimes coach students like that and let them know like, look, it's so normal for students to be in your position. I wouldn't worry about this. Often the self-conscious, it's not always, I don't want to make it sound like a silver bullet, but often they do get past it, especially if you coach them. I've thought about giving incentives to say like, look, if your faction has a speech by somebody whose first language is not English, I will build in some kind of extra reward. So you could actually design the game to incentivize that, to turn those students to that they, they, their situation becomes a plus rather than something for them to be uh, worried about. Another issue where inclusion, I think, really becomes important is I once had a student with very serious anxiety issues who said, like, look, um, public speaking is just it's not going to go well for me. And now just as it happened, that game was the Copenhagen game, which is set at a big climate change meeting in Copenhagen in 2009. And there was a role in that game of a journalist who doesn't give speeches. They they give a speech, but in the form of a video. And I said, well, how would you feel about giving your speech not in front of the class live, but on a video? And that worked for that student. So that now, so now in the future, if I ever find a student with like really serious anxiety issues, I'll offer them that option, even if the role itself is not one with video built in. So, so there can be issues around inclusion, and they do sometimes require creative management. But of course, that's nothing new. We face a different version of that same problem in the traditional classroom, and we we don't let that hold us back there. So there's no reason to let it hold us back in gameplay either. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, because it's not that they are not alienated in classic teaching. And that's something that the more I talk to people about reacting games, they are saying that like there are there can be problems, but these problems already exist. It's not that they are, they are not, it's not that, oh, there are new problems. They were there already. Uh, uh, and it, if it helps, it, it helps to improve towards that. Uh, so one thing that uh, you mentioned already in the conversation as well, and uh, talking to others they mentioned, is that there is a, a, the argumentation might not be like super strictly philosophic, might go as rhetoric, might just be yes. like convincing yeah. others. Yeah. yeah. So how do you address that problem? Um, there's a couple of ways. Uh, so one thing you can do is you can try to design the assessment, the writing assignment afterwards to get past that. So in my experience, the temptation just to go into sophistry rather than philosophy, um, uh, and when I see that happening, I will sometimes gently step in and, and say things like, now, is this really in keeping with your character? Stuff like that. I always have a writing assignment after the game where they have to defend their decisions in the game. And so if it goes too far, I can just step up and say, like, how is this going to help your game narrative at the end? And that often is a little bit of a course correction. I know one, one um, professor, she tells her writing assignment afterwards is analyze the tr the, tr the most sound argument in the game and the least sound. And they write from their own point of view 
So they're once again analyzing arguments. They happen. They just happen to be arguments that came up in the game, but it's not them writing, you know, just to make a point or something. So, so that is in a philo- in the philosophy class context. That that is, I think, the number one issue that you have to kind of look out for. Um, but there are positive trade offs. Like I say, students in my focus group said things like, you know, I went out and I bought all the books by the philosopher who I was playing in the game because I was so engaged by what she was saying. I've never heard a student say that in a conventional game, right? Um, And they say things like, I felt like I really had to know the arguments in a much deeper way than I would in a traditional class where it's often like, okay, this week is Rawls week. Okay, what's on? What's Rawls about? Okay, dump truck mind, move on to the next one. So there, there it's, this is a real issue you highlight, but I think it's it's manage it's manageable, and there are positives as well. Mm. Uh, uh, connected to that, I was wondering, I was thinking, if we do a role immersion game, and there is a character that would have like positions that we would consider as like despicable, like sexist or racist. Uh, can that lead to a problem? Like I'm thinking here that like, I don't know, maybe some students might feel uncomfortable with, uh, depending on the game, of course, some games it will not have this problem, but other games might have this problem. So what do you think, like, is there a problem there? Like, are there topics that we shouldn't, like characters that no student should play? How would you address this problem? So when I use the French Revolution game, slavery is a topic in that game. And there are some students whose role sheets oblige them to give pro-slavery speeches. So as you can imagine, that's a sensitive issue. So one thing, this has never come up, but I don't allow people to film stuff in the class because you don't want to create a film clip of somebody giving, say, a pro-slavery speech, and then it gets out there out of context. But... One of the points I try to make when I'm introducing that material is I is I say, you know, there's a great temptation for us to think, especially when we look back to racism in the past, there's a temptation to think that when people said and did racist things, they must have been clearly diabolical as if they had horns on their head. But it's actually in some ways much more both dispiriting but much more realistic to realize that people who would otherwise would otherwise would seem admirable upstanding members of society could be deeply infected by racism so by embodying it in that way you are in a way making a point and you are bringing home the reality of racism in a way that gets past the idea that it's always going to be something that is a flaw of these kind of cartoon supervillains. And precisely if we really passionately care about racism, that can be a reason to immerse ourselves in those historical milieus in order to better understand its wellsprings and fingers crossed guard against it in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah, that's great, Andy. Everything you said, and I will also recommend people about for your paper because it address all these questions. Most of these questions I have asked you addressed in in your paper. Uh, uh, Is there anything that I didn't ask you would like to add about the reacting games? Um, no. uh, What? There's one thing, and this is more for faculty who might be thinking about trying it out. So here in North America, there's this well-developed network of training conferences that I that I mentioned. But something that helped me when I was first getting into this was first because it was new, I was a little bit apprehensive. And so I remember thinking, you know what? I'm probably not gonna be perfect when I try out this new teaching method. So I just gave myself permission to make a few mistakes. And um, I did, I remember I had to make a mistake. I made a mistake in the class the first time I used it. But then in the beginning of the next class, I just told the class like, look, by the way, I made this mistake. I got to correct it this way. And, and it was fine. We just we just went on. So I would So I would say, there's value in not letting fear of the unknown hold you back if you're interested in experimenting and trying this new teaching method, which has all the features that positive features that Mark mentioned. Um, uh, it's worth it's worth giving giving it a shot, and the and the benefits ultimately outweigh the 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 possible risks. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very very much for for accepting the interview. And when I publish this video, I will use parts of this video. It's one video that I'm interviewing many people and it's about how to use games to teach philosophy. And so it's, and then I want to publish everything separately as well for people who are interested in these things, if they're going to go deeper on, on, on these issues. So thank you very much, Andy.
Okay, well, thanks, thanks for asking me. I'll be interested to see the final video. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Take care. Thanks. Bye.